the DeepSeek R1 model. It's all over the news. But to many in the AI community, the most important story that the headlines are missing is a different model. It's DeepSeek R1 Zero. In this video, I'll explain why the model is so important, and you'll get to watch a simplified version of this innovative training process. Stay tuned. If you're just tuning into this channel for the first time, I'm Ishan. I'm an AI consultant and educator. I'm best known for implementing an LLM entirely in pure Excel. I use that Excel file to teach anyone who can read a spreadsheet how AI works. I'll put the link to the class in the description, but that's why this channel is called Spreadsheets Are All You Need. Okay, let's get started. So the first thing to understand is that when a large language model is trained on, say, all the text on the internet, it's not naturally a chatbot. All it knows how to do is complete the text it saw on the internet. So here's GPT-2 small. And if I just say first name, it comes back with first name, password, email. If I give it, say, another prompt, like, hello, class. This is uh, a prompt I use in my class. I thought it would say, hello, teacher. Instead, what it comes back with is hello class foo public static void main string args. It's giving me Java code. Okay, what the heck is happening here? Well, we have to go into how the model is trained. What happens is the model is given pieces of text gathered from, say, the internet, and we'll take the last word or the last token and we'll chop it off. So in this case, we've got the phrase Mike is quick, he moves quickly. We'll chop off the last word or token. And then I'll ask the model to make a prediction, even at the very beginning of the training process, and it's not very smart at this point, so it predicts the wrong word. It might say, Mike is quick, he moves bicycle. So we'll use an algorithm called backpropagation to adjust all the parameters, all the weights of the model gradually until it finally starts giving us the right answer. So instead of Mike is quick, he moves bicycle, it says Mike is quick, he moves quickly. And we'll do this not just for one sentence, we'll do this for large amounts of text. The problem is that at this point, all the model knows how to do is imitate what it's been given. It's just predicting the next word based on web pages on the internet. That's different from being a chatbot. The reason why the model is saying, hello class foo, is because it saw a lot of hello world examples with Java code and it learned to associate that. The reason why if I say first name, colon, and it then says first name, name address is because it thinks it's part of a form and it's just filling it out. It's just hypothesizing what type of web page it's in and then completing the rest of the text. So to go from something like GPT-2, which we just saw, it's referred to these days as a base model, to something more like ChatGPT or a chatbot or an assistant is a much more complex additional set of training shown here in this diagram from the state of GPT, which was a talk by Andre Karpathy. And I put the YouTube link here. I'll also put it in the description. Let me walk through what this process is at a high level. So first, we train the model to imitate text on the internet. We already saw what that gets us with GPT-2. The next thing we do is what's referred to as supervised fine-tuning. We train the model on examples of a helpful assistant. I have an example here from the Alpaca dataset. You can see it's basically say, give me instruction for three tips for staying healthy. And the output is, A, eat a balanced diet, make sure you get plenty of fruits and vegetables, et cetera, et cetera. There's another one here. What are the three primary colors? The three primary colors are red, blue, and yellow. So we basically just give it lots of these combinations to learn on. And it's going to learn to imitate these much in the same way it learned to imitate the text on the internet. I want you to note, though, as you can see here, there's 10 to 100,000 examples that are being written by humans to train this model. So it's a lot of human work and labor. Then we get into the reinforcement learning from human feedback part of the pipeline. So the first part of this is we derive a scoring model from human labeled data. This is, think of it like a teacher grading everyone's assignments, except instead of a human, it's going to be another computer model separate from our training model. So basically the way this model is created, and this is the examples from the Anthropic paper, is you ask the model to answer a series of questions. So here, for example, is questions around, I want to make pumpkin pie for Thanksgiving. And then you ask the model to come up with two different completions for it, and you choose and reject different ones. So here, this one's a lot better because it's telling us, grab this amount of sugar, this amount of puree, this amount of baking powder, put it in the oven for how long. Whereas the other version, 
not so great was basically like uh bake some pumpkin pie and it'll have there'll be a recipe on the package not very helpful uh here's an example of harmlessness uh from the harmless data set so this one's about uh alcohol and the rejected one is basically go ahead drink whatever you want here and the helpful version says hey maybe you should think about a different way of managing your stress so at the end of that we have a new model derived from human preference data again Look at how many times humans are looking at those examples that came out of the model and then rating them chosen and rejected. Then finally, we take that scoring model, that teacher model, although that's not what the term we typically use, we use the term reward model, and we train the model again through a different training process that's not imitation to reinforce the preferences from the teacher or scoring model. And that's the last step here. And again, I want you to note how much human work has gone into this whole process. So to summarize, we start by training a model to learn all the text on the internet and it learns a bunch of general purpose knowledge. Then we train it to be correct at a specific task by asking it to mimic examples of what we consider to be ideal outputs. Then we create a whole separate model of what we think humans would prefer and we reinforce those preferences through a different training process at the very end called reinforcement learning. Okay, what did R10 do differently? It basically took this part out, it took this part out, and it took this part out, and it basically went straight from base model all the way to a reasoning chatbot in one step. And I wanna emphasize, the reasoning models are like OpenAI's O1, where they think before they speak and they'll spend more time thinking to figure the right answer out. So how did they do this? Well, they took the base model and they used a database of math and code problems. They fed that into the base model and asked it to answer those questions. And for each answer, they asked it to generate multiple versions of the answer. And then they would score each of those answers. Now, normally that scoring could either be done by a human or a carefully constructed model based on human preferences. But because these are math and code problems, the answers are easy for a computer to score. It can easily check if there's a right answer. That makes this process a ton more scalable and reduces the amount of human annotation we need. Then they adjust the weights in order to reward the problems that were correct or the thinking patterns that were correct and update the weights of the model so it's a little bit smarter and better at those answers. And if you repeat this process a ton of times, eventually you end up with a reasoning model. And you can actually see this in the paper right here where they note that all of a sudden the model got smarter. It just started saying, wait, 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 there's an aha moment that I can flag here. And it suddenly has realized it can change its thinking and go evaluate other options than where it's headed. And they note this is an aha moment, not just for the model, but also for the researchers to observe the model suddenly getting smarter. Okay, so next I wanna show you this process a little more concretely. Since the paper came out, there've been multiple reproductions of R10 or smaller versions of it. So here's one called RagGen. Here's another one called Tiny Zero. I'll put the links for these in the description. I'm gonna use this one from Will. I like it because it's really simple and straightforward. It cheats a little bit because it uses an instruct model instead of a pure base model, but it gives you a sense of the idea. I've put it inside RunPod and I'll just walk through the code and I've changed it slightly. The first thing it's doing is getting a bunch of questions from this data set called GSM 8K. We're gonna see what these questions look like. <clears throat> and then I've logged all the information about what questions it's asking, what reward it gave it to a CSV file that we'll take a look at in a bit. But basically it's got a set of these reward functions that are looking at the answer and they're judging it by some clear, objective, simple criteria. So here, for example, it just judges if it's answering it in the right format. So at the start of this, we basically give it this prompt, respond in the following format. Put your reasoning here, put your answer here, and then we check if it matches that format. There's another reward function that's checking for XML tags and just the count of them. There's another one checking if the answer is a digit or not. I've taken this one, which checks if the answer is correct, and then logged out essentially what the results are. So you can actually see that below. That's what all this is. So here, for example, is the very first thing it does. It uses this first question. It says, Ahmed and Emily 
having a contest to see who has the best grade in class. It goes through that. And then here's the correct answer. And then it asks it to come up with a, an answer. It asks, this is the completion from the model. And then it tries to extract an answer out of it. It extracts this, which is not the right answer. We just want the final number. And so it gets no reward out of this. And then we give it the question again, right here. And then we ask it again to complete this. We do this basically, in this case, 16 times for every question. So this isn't R1, 0 fully. It's the core idea applied to a very simple set of problems. And then I log that all to a CSV file, which I have here. So here you can see the same question being asked time and time again. And then here's the response coming back from the model. And then an extracted answer. So in this case, it extracted 828. So it's clearly getting these wrong to begin with. Let's scroll down and see. There we go. Here's one in green. And we see that what it's finally figured out how to do, here's the response that came back from the model. It finally started using these answer tokens. And it's got the right answer here, 900, which we know from our database, the correct answer is 900. So we give it a reward score. So this is the first time, or maybe one of the first times we get a reward. And slowly the model gets better and better at picking up that reward. In It's hard to see here in the spreadsheet, but if we come over to the weights and biases logs, which logs the metrics, it's a lot easier to see. So here's the overall reward of the model over various training steps. And you can see right here around 100, it starts picking up. And by 150 to 200, it's basically start getting good overall reward. Now, remember, though, we had multiple of these reward functions in here that we were judging it based on. And so some of these, it's learning better than others. And we can see that if we dig in to a few of these other panels. So here is whether it's giving us digits. Here's another one, whether it's giving us the correct answer. Here's another one that's tracking the completion link. So we can see that various of these other words, some are being learned better than others, and it's gradually getting smarter entirely through an automated fashion with another computer as a judge just saying, hey, think better, think better, think better, and it slowly gets smarter. So the last thing I want to highlight is one of the reactions from the community. This is the ARC Prize. If you are not familiar with the ARC Prize, it is considered the toughest test for large language models and machine learning to pass in this area. And the title of this article headlines that R10 is more important than R1, which is also the thesis of this uh, video. But the reason uh, they highlight it is it removes the human bottleneck, right? Remember back when we went through this process, all the human annotation that needs to be done here. And now you can get rid of that and go straight from a base model to a helpful assistant, not just any helpful assistant, but a reasoning helpful assistant in a lot fewer steps. Okay, well, I hope you enjoyed this video. Please let me know in the comments whether you liked it or not. Don't feel bad for negative feedback because the very best learn from feedback constructive or not, just like a machine learning model. So please give me some of that RLHF in the comments. Thank you, and I'll see you in the next one.